Hey, this is Rob Riggle. You're listening to Out of Left Field on the Grueling Truth Network. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Out of Left Field on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. Graham and Chris back with you again. Brought to you by MyBookie.ag, where you can get a $1,000 sign-up bonus when you tell them you heard about MyBookie.ag on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. Just go to thegruelingtruth.com, click the MyBookie.ag banner on the top of the page, and complete your registration. Got a full show for you today. Atlanta Braves second baseman Ozzie Albies has the baseball world buzzing after signing a mind-boggling extension. Two expected American League division front runners continue to have big pitching concerns. And Baltimore Orioles first baseman Chris Davis has tripled his hit total in one single game. Let's put the ball in play and head up I-95 to SunTrust Park and the Atlanta Braves. And Ozzie Albies signs a seven-year extension, which – just hearing seven-year extension makes it enough to go, well, damn. But then when you couple seven-year extension with $35 million, all of a sudden you go, damn. Yeah, this is not a good deal for Ozzy Alsby. I'm not really sure what he was thinking when he signed this deal. Um, the baseball world is sort of a buzz with this because this is bad news for other young ball players. Um, just like I said, the Acuna deal – uh, where he got a hundred over a hundred million, hundred and twenty-four million before he even reached arbitration, set a good precedent for young ball players. This sets the opposite precedent. Uh, you've got a kid who was two years away from arbitration, still under rookie control, is now going to be under control with this ball cub until he's almost 31. And the chances of him getting a nine-figure contract at the age of 31 are well there are no chances only two players have ever done it so what a rod um, pools um a rod so, well <laughs> testing no only two only two players have ever done it in free agency okay okay i got you i got you okay jd position players jd martinez and yoana cespedes okay after have, have tested the market after turning 30 and gotten nine figure contracts well for example this year, the biggest the biggest over thirty position player contract offered was AJ Pollock sixty million dollars. Well, and, and so, if we take this whole thing and actually put it to, you know, a a a scenario of comparisons here, if you look at some of the big names of guys who had between one and two years of big league service, talking Yelich, uh, Angels and Simmons, obviously was with the Braves at the time, now with the Angels, Anthony Rizzo. Yelich had a seven-year, $49.5 million deal. Simmons, seven years, 58 mil. And Rizzo, seven years, 41 mil. And I believe all those guys have gotten you know, progressively more. And, I mean, there's no doubt that Yelich is going to get more after he wins the MVP last year and I think easily is, is being looked at again as the same kind of thing. But this is one of those moments where I'm almost surprised. Well, I wonder – what was said behind the scenes that necessitated the feeling that this needed to happen. But at the same time, it also makes me wonder, why didn't the MLBPA step in here and try and kind of nix this deal? Because that, that really begins to put, you know, a, a really rough look for, for guys going forward. And all of a sudden now the precedent becomes, well, hell, we can pay these – really, really young guys, uh, less money for a longer term, start saving money when we've already had contract issues in the last two years anyway. And I think you and I both believe this is going to be a big point of contention in the new CBA uh, agreement coming up here in the next couple of years. But, I mean, it's like, it's like the guy, and forgive me, I can't recall his name, and I'll look it up while, while, while you're, you're talking. Uh, but for the Phillies, who hadn't even played – what, I think an inning of big league ball and got a four-year, like $30 million, something to that effect uh, this offseason we talked about. Right, right. And the the issue that I have with this with this situation is that um, I feel like the Braves have, have kind of taken advantage of, of Ozzy Albies here. He, you're talking about a young kid coming from Caraco who – his family was in a bad situation. He signed out of Caraco in, 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 at the age of 16. 
for 350000 He comes here. He makes almost nothing in the minor leagues, comes up to the big leagues, gets stuck to the league minimum. And then, and then this, which, you know, Jeff Passan is calling the possibly the worst contract ever for a player, quote, and this is not hyperbole, unquote. Um, and you can tell that, that Albies is in a situation where he feels like he has to sign this contract because his response to why did you do this is, quote, I don't look at it from money because I'm not playing for money. I'm playing for my career. I took it because I want my family to be safe, end quote. I have a huge problem with that. If the guy is worth money, he needs to be paid that money. He should never be in a position where he signs a contract that is a detriment to his ability to make income simply because his family needs to be safe. The Braves need to do better by this guy. Well, I I, I don't know if I necessarily am down with, with that side of the argument. This guy is probably saying, hey, look, you know, I, I'm looking for something, um, you know, some kind of long-term whatever type of love. But in All-Star last year, he's been in the league now uh, just over 200 games. Uh, you know, as of right now, at least, looking at a guy who's hitting in the upper 260s and above, hitting 321 right now, uh, it's 24 homers last year. So you are paying this guy a lot of money, um, and then you're you're hoping for production down the line. I think the hardest thing for me on that, in all honesty, is the feeling as though – I don't know. I, I, I just don't understand why you're going to go – you know, I mean, seven years on that. Yeah, that's a lot of time, but – I mean, hey, if he agrees to it, that's great. Keep in mind, there's also a, a team option in the last two years of the deal. So his age 28, 29 and age 30 seasons, there's a, a team option of $7 million each year and a buyout of $4 million in 2026, his age 29 years. So there is still the possibility that the Braves can go ahead and, and add more to it if he's performing well. Maybe. But it maxes out. It maxes out at nine years, forty-five million. That's right. that's not a good contract for this kid. We're talking about a kid who last year was just as good a ball player as as Ronald Acuna, and Ronald Acuna Jr. gets one hundred and twenty-four million. This kid gets thirty-five. I feel like I feel like. I'm sorry, but I feel like they're taking advantage of him. I don't think that this is a good contract for him. I think the Braves need to do better by this kid. Yeah, and that's probably the hardest part of this whole argument is how do you pay Acuna the amount of money that you did and then sit back and – because Albies, what, didn't just didn't jump off the page at you immediately, makes you want to go, well, you know, we'll see what happens – but we're looking at, at a guy here who is is really their their numbers aren't that far off. So last year in Acuna's rookie year, played in 111 games, 26 home runs, hit 293, a 917 OPS. And then you look at uh, at Ozzy Albie's in 158 games, 24 home runs, a 261 average. 757 OPS. So yes, we know that Acuna's power numbers are definitely, I think, well beyond what Albie's is. But I think at the same time, with something like this, it if I'm Dansby Swanson, that's probably what concerns me. Is now you've got a guy under team control for a long amount of time, and Swanson, this is kind of his year, I think, to find out who he is, what he's going to do, and go from there. So this is also the possibility of the Braves to kind of put their foot down and say, either show us what you can do or get up and out of here. So right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how this plays out with other players on that roster. Yeah. I mean, I am too. I, I feel like 
this is this is just a bad precedent for other young kids. That's the only problem I have with it. It sets a bad, I mean, it's bad for him, obviously. I have a problem with the fact that it's a bad deal for this kid, but also because we're right back to teams doing things to keep, to keep these guys under control at the minimum salary for as long as possible. And this is a kid who's probably going to get a nine figure deal. If he, if he uh, goes into free agency at 25. Yeah, maybe, but at the same time, we also know that it, at some point, the the, the ceiling is going to stop being glass and is going to become stone. So I'm not saying that at this time you want to be the guy who begins to harden the ceiling, but if if there was concern over what could happen and Albies is sitting here going, you know what, I've got a chance to make life-changing money and I can do it right now instead of having to – bet on myself down the road and the possibility of not. And he puts his family first at the same time. While I, I hate the precedent that it sets kudos to him for at least doing. it. Yeah. I mean, I guess um... I, 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 I get your frustration and I think it's easy to sit back and go, man, I, I would have waited and taken more money, but you know, I mean, when we see guys from Curacao, we've seen, you know, obviously a lot of Little League teams make it from Curacao in the Little League World Series. So you see these kids, you see what a lot of these players who have come from Curacao have lived in and what their families still live in. And you have a chance to change your entire family's existence. And they are the ones who've sacrificed all this so you can be here at this point. Uh, you know, it just, it, there is at some point, I do believe, a an ideological and a cultural difference in the way that they view what, what they're taking in. And in this, I think in this moment, Ozzy Albee sees a way that, that, that he can change his family's lives forever who have put themselves in the back burner for 23, 24 years so that he can become a successful baseball player. I mean, I guess that's a way to look at it. I mean, I, I, know, I know you would smack your kid if they ever took a deal like this, but I'm just saying maybe his parents are a little more, you know, they, they look at it differently. You and I would be like, why? You know, I could, have, I, I could have had three extra cars if you just waited a little bit longer. It's not about, it's not about his purchasing power. It's about paying had an the extra, kid. Had an extra small donkey in your backyard. It's about paying the kid what he's worth. Sure. And. I just don't feel that that's what the Braves are doing here. I really don't. So let's move over to the National League Central. Uh, not disagreeing with you on that, but we have another one we could talk about, which is Matt Carpenter, the first and third baseman, longtime veteran leader for the St. Louis Cardinals. He gets a two-year contract extension through the 20 and 20, uh, 2020 and 2021 seasons. He will get $39 million bucks on the new deal his uh, he was supposed to after this year was supposed to be the end of his deal with an option for next season. You know, this is kind of nice for him. Matt Carpenter had a year last year where he was terrible, then he was MVP caliber, then he wasn't so good. And if he can string a lot of the MVP caliber type stuff this year, a he well might win the MVP, and also that might be one of those catalysts that makes the Cardinals a playoff team which they very damn near became in the 2018 season. Well, Matt Carpenter is this, – this, the reason I like this so much is because I think Matt Carpenter needs to finish his career as a Cardinal. He's, he's been there forever, um, and I think that this makes him more comfortable. He was – he is making a bunch of money, a bunch more money – than he was going to make. He was going to make 18 and a half million. Now he's going to make 30, 39 million uh, for 20 and 21. And when you, when you add the fact that they bring in Paul Goldschmidt, right. And they're playing good baseball. They're not playing as good a baseball as I think you or you or I expected them to, but they're playing pretty good baseball in the central right now. Um, I think it's good to make Matt Carpenter comfortable. I think it's good to make, to, to make Matt Carpenter, Matt Carpenter feel like this is the team that he's going to retire from um, if he does retire 
you know, as, as this contract expires. But Matt Carpenter says, you know, now it's time to go out and get that title. That's, that's, that was his words. And I think that a comfortable Matt Carpenter, uh, a guy who um, has every bit of the ability to come out here and be a leader on this team. Um, he's never been, you know, the big bat on the team, I guess. Uh, he, he's only ever finished in the top five in MVP voting once. That was in 2013. But the guy had 36 home runs last year. You know, it 23 the year before. If if he can come out and do that, you had Paul Goldschmidt, um, a couple other big pieces that they had in the off season. They very well could, at the very least, play play the role of spoiler to some of the some of the teams that we think are are postseason bound. Well, and you're looking at a guy here, and I think that's the thing. And we talk about a lot, right? How are you? Know, oh, how many did he, did he drive in? And they always say numbers don't lie, which is we know is, is a bunch of crap. Numbers lie probably the most of anything. You can skew them any way that you want. But if we stop for a second and sit back here and look at the 158 strikeouts, but 102 walks that Matt Carpenter had last year, the 374 on base percentage, which was 120 points higher than his batting average last year. We look at the, as you mentioned, 36 home runs, the 42 doubles. That's 78 extra base hits out of the 145 total hits that he had last year. So he's getting himself in scoring position or at least – or scoring himself on over half of the times that he gets on base by making contact with the baseball. And mind you, scored 111 runs last year. So he is putting himself in prime position to create offense for that team. And if that continues, that is going to be the key thing right now. Early on, he has a triple, which he didn't have last year. Already has a dinger, already has four doubles. Granted, yes, is his batting average a little bit lower? Right now he's at 235, but guess what? He is still almost 100 points higher with his on-base percentage. He knows how to get on base. That veteran piece right there with him, Yadier Molina, goalie coming over who I have no doubt is going to be uh, – is already embraced in that clubhouse because of the person he is. He is going to find a way to be involved in the St. Louis area community. Uh, this is a, a really good opportunity for Matt Carpenter to stay, I think, hopefully retire as a St. Louis Cardinal, take him up to his age 35 year. They can give him another one or two year deal, make him comfortable. Hopefully he gets ready to go ahead and move on from the game and be a class act guy, retire in, in one uniform, such a rare feat these days. Right. And let's not forget that in addition to being a class act, in addition to, to, to being a lifetime Cardinal, he's also a damn good ball player. So if, if it makes sense to get somebody on, on a contract that for all intents and purposes is designed to make them feel a little bit better about where they're playing and, and, and who they're working for, I think Matt Carpenter is the guy to do it for. Makes the most sense, right? It's a guy who knows the ins and outs of your clubhouse. He knows what the heartbeat of that ball club is. He knows the heartbeat of that city. That's one of the things that you want, even especially when you're going to have a leadership change. And we know that midway through the year last year, of course, Mike Matheny gets fired. They bring an interim manager. He's now the, the head skipper there. You, you get a chance to have some continuity there with him, with Yachty. That is what always, I think, makes – the Cardinals a dangerous team it's why you and I never really have this team out of the running it's why we were so surprised that they struggled so much two years ago and again last year granted they ended up finishing third and that was because the central ended up really being a pretty big slugfest between Milwaukee and Chicago this year they have a really good opportunity to build on that and maybe come in there and knock somebody out who thinks that little brother who didn't make it last year still doesn't have the pop to go ahead and land a good punch there's a good possibility here that uh, you know they're going to have a big right hook and someone's going to go down and the cardinals are going to find their way into a postseason position well and 
I mean, obviously we're going to talk about this later, but looking at the, looking at the national league, there's a lot of teams that you and I, you and I had talked about being postseason contenders. Uh, and let's face it, the Cardinals were one of those teams, but teams other than the Cardinals that you and I talked about being postseason contenders that right now don't look like they can beat the Cardinals. Exactly. And, and there's a lot of teams right now, early on, at least our picks look really funky. <laughs> I mean, that's just, yeah, they do. Yeah. You know, we're, so, we're having a bit of some a, of our, some of our picks look like they're going to go down in flames at this point. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I'm not, not overly happy, but I will say something else that went down in flames yesterday. Finally was the 0 for 54 hitless streak of Baltimore Orioles first baseman Chris Davis that stemmed all the way from September last year all the way through almost the entire first month of the Major League season. He almost managed to make a DiMaggio-esque streak of 0 for 56. And then what does he do? He goes from zero hits for the last 54 at-bats to three hits and some RBIs yesterday as the Baltimore Orioles, four RBIs, I believe, as the Baltimore Orioles topped the Boston Red Sox at Fenway Park. Well, well I mean, good for him. He, he was excited. Obviously, he needed to get out from under this, this uh, heavy sort of monkey on his back, the, the, the 0 for 54. Um, but so the nice asking, thing to see – Asking for the baseball. <laughs> the, the nice thing to see was how excited all of his teammates were. Yes. Um, you know, because they know he's struggling. They know he's going through it. They're probably not talking to him on the bench a whole lot. And, you know, just to kind of give him some space. But he, he, I think was, well, he even says flat out that he was excited to see that they were excited because, uh, you know, it was a lot for him. It was a lot for him to be under. Um, but it was not – um, it was not DiMaggio. DiMaggio, DiMaggio hit in 56 straight games. We're not 56 games into the season, thank God. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. You're right. At, at bats, you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, if if he went if he went over for 56 straight games, we'd be having still a on whole the league after going over for 30 straight games. I'd be no. I, I'm 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 obviously playing off the off the number. There. Right, right, right. Plus, it was the record but, of of a of a positional player hitless streak. Six sixty two consecutive plate appearances, um, and fifty four consecutive recorded at bats. So, yes, that's a record, and it's not the kind of record anybody wants to have. I'm really glad that he got over it. I'm really glad that he he put the bat on the ball. He hit right it right in between the shift too, which is, which is pretty awesome. You know, they, they put the shift on, thought they had his number and he beat it. Yeah. And Picked I think that doubles makes it even... yesterday as well. Right. Right. Um, so when you said he tripled his numbers, um, not hard to do when your number's zero, <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. I'm glad, I'm glad he's finally, it's what's going to be, what's going to be key is, to get him on a few consecutive games hitting the ball, you know. Hey, the, but the important thing is this. In, in, in his next 1,000 at-bats, we can expect 79 hits. Right, right. And I figure that a .079 batting average is, is better than trip zero. That's right. Yeah, that, I mean, hey, <laughs> you know, with that kind of mentality, you could be a math teacher. I, I I agree on that, but you know, but I like my life. <laughs> it, it, it's been tough, and you know, I mean, at, at this point, it, it is. It's good for him at least that he was able to. Uh, I'm I'm actually curious to see if this begins if he actually goes on a bit of a tear. Um, you know, if it's finally kind of the weight off his back of okay, you know, now let's see what happens, and if in the next couple of weeks we actually see a a somewhat human ish type of batting average um because last year he was at one i think 168 was his final so it, it, it'll be nice if he actually or, or i think maybe last year it was, it was 198 he, he finished below the mendoza line uh, yeah finished last year in a 168 average 190 
two strikeouts to 41 walks. At least so far this year, uh, his strikeout to walk ratio is a is a smidge better. Um, you know, and and now his offensive WAR is up only to a negative 0.5 with some of those oh. some of those positive batting numbers yesterday, which is much better than a negative 2.5 from last year. I will say this. This is probably one of my favorite quotes from any article that I read in preparation for today's show. This is from the MLB.com article about uh, Chris Davis breaking his hitting streak. Where he says, leading up to Saturday's game, Davis had what he described as, quote, probably the worst BP round in the history of baseball, end quote. He took it as a good sign. <laughs> I mean, hey, it's at some point you got to just go, okay, well, if you're smacking the cover off the ball during BP and you can't put the ball in play, you know, during your uh, during your normal ABs, maybe the fact that, you know what, you just – I mean, hell, if I'm the hitting – if I'm, if I'm the, the BP coach, just hit him. Just just, scr- just plunk him. You know what? What are you doing? Tell, hey, your, tell your BP. Up. We're just changing it up a little bit. <laughs> you tell the guy throwing BP, uh, uh, put one on his shoulder. <laughs> oh, so as we swing back around here uh, to the East Coast, so the New York Yankees, and we will be talking about uh, our standings. First time we're going to bring you standings this week, and excitingly, we have two more weeks before we we bring out our first uh, out of left field power rankings for the 2018 season. But the New York Yankees sit second in the American League East, mind you. All but one team in the American League East is below 500. New York Yankees are no exception, sitting at six and eight, a half game up on the Baltimore Orioles. Yes, that's right. That means the Baltimore Orioles are in third place. If you saw that coming, go ahead and send us a shot of something, because Lord knows we didn't. No. uh, So – Things getting a little bit worse as CC Sabathia finally came back, pitched a really nice gem. Uh, I think uh, uh, I think a one hit on five innings pitch, something to that effect, the, the day before. So, which is really nice to see as he's kind of beginning his farewell tour. Now it's been revealed that Luis Severino revealed an M- had an MRI that revealed a grade two latch strain, going to cause him to be shut down from throwing for the next six weeks, meaning he is likely going to be out. Uh, the next six to eight weeks at minimum as he was rehabbing from shoulder inflammation. So these two injuries are linked likely because the lat injury uh, or the strain coming as he's rehabbing the shoulder, but not inextricably as is one cause the other, which is a good thing. The shoulder is getting healthy, but now you have to be concerned that the inflammation, you're not going to be able to, to do the same rehab. And it just seems to keep on <laughs> piling up 11 players currently on the injured list for the New York Yankees. That is just, I'm sure, gleeful in laughter at this moment, just, you know, just howling as he's excited to see this team just struggle. But at the end of the day, man, I mean, you know, Gary Sanchez is, uh, is on the DL or on the IL. We talked to you about that. He had, I think a, a calf or a groin strain. So he goes down for, for about 10 days. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, this begins to get concerning for the Yankees. Paxton is is healthy. We hope for a while. Tanaka, Hap. At some point, I'm sorry, Dallas Keuchel, sign the guy. Well, you yeah. Know, I, I, I mean, sign I mean, the guy. Or, or, you know, I mean, go out there and look at the guys who are still sitting down. I mean, there's still a couple. But Dallas Keuchel's probably the most logical signing right now but we know that we don't want to we don't want the the Yankees don't want to have to run this rotation with two rookies in the rotation and you can tell they don't want to run Gio Gonzalez out there yet because he hasn't started a game since the end of spring training right and and Gio Gonzalez was probably the guy that made the most most sense he was the signing that made the most sense especially in the situation that they were in with CeCe Sabathia down with uh, Luis Severino down with that shoulder injury and now with the latch strain. But but that was that was the most him. dense thinking he needed maybe two starts and you could move on from him. Not a consistent right. six-week fill-in. 
Right. They signed him and they kept him on that on that weird contract that they gave him, but they're not running him out, which they need to pull the trigger on on somebody because as of right now, six weeks is a long time at the beginning of the season. If they keep continue to stay behind the the Tampa Bay Rays as far as they are now and stay under that 500 um, play under playing 500 ball, they're going to be in a lot of trouble as July and August roll around. And let me give you another good reason why you don't want to have to roll out Gio Gonzalez. As of right now, he is at Scranton Wilkes Bar in the International League in AAA. He has a one and one record with a 7.2 earned run average in 10 innings pitch. He's given up 11 wow. hits, eight earned runs. He's walked four, struck out 11. So as of right now, Gio Gonzalez and the minors does not look good. Unlike Carlos Gonzalez, who is going to get promoted to the Cleveland Indians from their AAA team, who's hitting 348 right now in AAA. Oh, man. Yeah. So That's rough. I mean, this is that moment where, you know, you manage to get Gio to a minor league deal. He accepts it, and you're still seeing a lot of concern from him, I mean, just in AAA. So I, I've got a really hard time with this. I don't know what Keuchel is requesting, and that is probably one of the the difficult things here. Um, it's got to be exorbitant, right? I mean, there's no way that Dallas Keuchel doesn't have a job if he's not asking for a bunch of money. Well, I, I think the issue here, and this is what where I, I believe the issue becomes, is the, the luxury tax. So the Yankees would pay a 32% tax on anything spent on Keuchel and forfeit their second highest draft pick and a half million dollars of international bonus money by signing him. So right now, the biggest thing is, I believe, because of the qualifying offer that the Astros made, they have up until, I believe it's past a trade deadline or somewhere at the halfway point, that qualifying offer to become null and void. But, um, you know, he really, he can't be offered more than, I believe, an end-of-the-year deal if he gets signed once that qualifying offer goes and he's back to being a free agent again. So all in all, the difficulty really is is – how much do the Yankees want to pay and how much is Keuchel wanting? If, if what he's wanting and what the tax would be plus the loss of the draft pick and the international bonus compensation really seems like an unfair amount for them, then unfortunately they're going to be really stuck trying to figure something out and just hope Severino gets healthy. The difficulty right. there is if he doesn't get healthy as quickly and the Red Sox begin to get hot, then the Yankees might begin to all of a sudden slide out of contention very, very rapidly. And that's a, that's a danger that you run into, you know? I mean, right now, the way it looks, obviously, like I said, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but right now, the way it looks, they're just the best of four teams that are struggling in the East. And not by much, by half a game. Are they better than the other, the other three? Uh, like you and said, only that Tampa Bay. Right, is that last year the power is kind of what saved them, but now if guys know how to attack the power and you don't have a rotation to try and put yourself in positive position, they're a team with a lot of money and a lot of pop and struggling to really have someone that can deliver the ball deep into the game. Right, and that's that's where we're going to see. I think. Uh, this this rotation starting to fall apart uh, really hurt the Yankees in the coming weeks. And I don't really have a I don't really have a logical a logical solution for it. There really isn't. I mean, the only solution is to, to either spend money or you know steroids. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Don't don't do that. No, don't spend money. Use steroids and hope they don't test them. Oh. Right, exactly. No, I was I was saying don't don't spend money. That's okay. a terrible plan. <laughs> Let's slide over to the American <laughs> League Central. Mike Clevenger, starter for the Cleveland Indians, out more than two months now. Uh, he was about to resume a throwing progression, and then all of a sudden, uh, it turned out that he has a uh, an upper back muscle strain. It was originally going to be a ten day injured list stint, and then turned out to be much much worse. By the time that he actually gets back to full pitching strength, looks like it's going to be at least two months for Mike Clevenger to be out. 
And that hurts this ball club. Again, the Indians, a team that you and I both thought were going to be comfortably on top of the American League Central, they sit a half game back of the Minnesota Twins. Surprisingly, three teams in that division above 500 right now. Um, and everybody really kind of bunched together for the top spot. There's a half game separating three teams from the top of the AL Central. And the fact that Mike Clevenger, who last year was a guy, uh, I'm sorry, you know, who gave you over 200 innings and a 13 8 record and a 302 ERA, that's someone that you need back in that lineup rapidly to try and put some distance between you and the teams that are nipping at your heels. And at least right now, that is not what is looking good. And it seems like the injury bug is just rampantly moving through Major League Baseball right now. Right. Especially since, I mean, the big deal for me for the Indians losing Clevenger, I mean, the rotation's already a concern, right? We, we've already been concerned with, with, uh, with uh, what, the, what the Indians were capable of doing uh, on the mound. But not only that, but their power guys are down too, right? You got Jason Kipnis, uh, who's hurt. He's playing in Triple A now, trying to trying to rehab. Um, you got Francisco Lindor, <laughs> who's kind of a big piece for this team at this point. Um, who's also down. He's coming back and he's 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 uh, hitting in the cage and he's fielding ground balls, but he's not anywhere near actually being back in game ready. And that's that's a big hit to this ball club that's that's sort of languishing in an already bad division and doing poorly and Clevenger um, started out well this year I mean you know he's a 1-0 record in two games he's pitched 12 innings only allowed two hits struck out 22 walked four uh you know I, I mean right now you know a whip of 0 0.5 grand it's only two games but still I mean this is a guy who Terry Francona needs out there to help support the Corey Klubers and those guys. And, and without having that, I think really we're about to see a shakeup in the MLB standings this year that we haven't seen, I think, since the show began. Right. And, you know, Francona is always positive, at least to the, at least to the press. I, I very rarely have ever seen Francona get, get sort of down on a situation, but, and he, he said, you know, we're going to figure this out. I feel like we always figure this out, but they're going to need to do some figuring quick, in my opinion. Otherwise this is going to get out of hand. And when you're, when you're talking about the Minnesota twins leading the central by virtue of having played one fewer game, right. we've got, we've got problems. We've got problems. The Cleveland Indians should have walked away with this division by default. It's going to be interesting, uh, you know. Um, I mean, right now, actually, they're looking at about three fewer. They're, they're seven and four. Everybody else is looking at, right, at right. 14 games. But this is, yeah, it's going to be interesting. When we come back after this word from mybookie.ag, we'll break down the standings as they currently sit, and we'll give you our top five, bottom three for this week in Major League Baseball. Don't go anywhere. Hi, I'm Mike Goodpasser from the Grueling Crew Sports Network, and we're here with one simple message. If you're watching the games, it's time to start making money. The Grueling Truth is partnered with MyBookie.ag, an industry-leading sportsbook website, who reminds you that where you bet is just as important as who you're betting on. And that's why the Grueling Truth urges you to check out MyBookie.ag. In addition to the usual thousands of odds, money lines, proposition bets, and futures offered on MyBookie.ag daily, they also have live in-game betting and a mobile site that makes wagering on the go easier than ever. So join now and mybookie.ag will give you a 50% bonus on the first deposit for up to $3,000 in extra playing money. Just enter promo code TGT50. That's TGT50 to take advantage of this offer. Visit MyBookie, courtesy of the Grueling Truth Network, and enjoy winning today. That's mybookie.ag. You play, you win, you get paid. And we're back here in Adelaide Field. So... We're going to give you a quick peek behind the curtain. So you're going to see this break as being about a minute long with the uh, co commercial from mybookie.ag. In reality, this was about a 15-minute stoppage 
because at this moment in time, Tiger Woods has just finished win it, uh, just finished winning the Masters, and I happened to see it come across my phone that he had the lead with two holes left. As we hit the commercial break, he was heading to the 18th, up to the green. So I told Chris, well, we're going to stop this right now for a quick moment, and I'm going to go watch that. <laughs> so Chris and I both are sitting here watching the end of the Masters as Tiger Woods wins. And, uh, you know, at some point I, I, I step back, as I do often with uh, ball players and whatnot, and separate the, the individual from the, from the athlete and the competitor. And, I mean, that was pretty cool to watch, you know, to, to, to see him uh, – I mean, I, if, if this isn't the catalyst to get him to, to break Jack's record, uh, all of a sudden the golf world is going to be an extreme upheaval for the next year or two. Yeah, it's going to be fun to watch too. Uh, I I liked watching golf when Tiger Woods was, was, you know, Tiger Woods. And it sort of lost some of its – some of its draw for me when – Some of its sex appeal? <laughs> no, some of it's draw for me when we were in that place where we went a few years wondering if Tiger Woods was ever going to win a major again or even place in a major again. And uh, here, he is, here he is getting another green jacket. I mean, he won at Liverpool, right? Um, which was big. Winning the open at Liverpool was huge. Um, but there's nothing like there's nothing like sliding on a green jacket after after a good four days of golf. Yeah, and, and you know, the fact that everything started early because of the weather that's about to come through, uh, I, I don't even believe they're going to have the green jacket ceremony outside because of the storms. And this was a shotgun start, which is obviously rare if it really never happens. And they were playing a threesome, so you had Molinari, Tony Finau, who is the boss who popped his ankle out last year and then popped it back in and then played the entire weekend. Um, and then, of course, Tiger with the last grouping. So just, I mean, I love that course. I would love to see it in person. It is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, just at least seeing it on TV, the way it, the, the greens pop, and it's just it's a beautiful place. So, But let's get back to baseball as we get into the Major League Baseball standings. And as we normally do, we'll start in the American League with the Eastern Division, and all of a sudden, hey, I can't have been, well, not my Rays. I don't claim ownership there. I go watch them when I can. I don't pay attention to them as a, as a daily fan habit. But right now, the Tampa Bay Rays are the only team above 500 in the American League East, which, of course, lends itself to them being the divisional leader. They're 11-4. and four. They're 7-3 and three in their last 10, uh, a plus 34 run differential, which is second only to the plus 36 of the Seattle Mariners. So this team is is finding a way to put the bat on the ball. Their pitching is really good. Obviously, you know, I had concerns just from the outset of the way Blake Snell looked, but you have Snell, Charlie Morton. Um, this, I'm really curious if this team is doing this well come deadline time if they decide to be buyers or if they try to hold pat with what they have and see if they can still contend into the playoffs to round it out, the Yankees who are four and six in their last 10 are a half game up on the Baltimore Orioles who are six and nine. And then a tie for the worst record in the American league East. And if I've mentioned the Rays, the Yankees and the Orioles, that means that yes, the world series champions are five and 10 six games off of the lead of the division and the Toronto Blue Jays as well sit there. Both of them with the, the Red Sox four and six, the Blue Jays three and seven in their last 10. And in talking about a team that has a lot of, you know, a, a lot of, of pop. The Colorado Rockies is the worst differential at minus 36. It, the problem is the Boston Red Sox, all that power are a minus 29 run differential. <laughs> And somehow playing uh, a win and a loss behind Baltimore Orioles, who have a worse run differential at negative 30. Um, sort of an interesting – it, it kind of makes you wonder what the heck is going on in Boston right now. And 
I said after the first few games, I said in opening weekend when Boston was was getting whacked around and when when uh, Chris Sale opened the season with that horrible opening day performance that the Red Sox maybe needed to get a little bit worried. And it looks now is three weeks into the season, they definitely need to be a little bit worried. I picked the Sox to win the division, but I will cede this to you. You said opening day, you thought the Red Sox should be concerned. What you saw concerned you enough that you told me, I think Boston needs to be worried. And now they, it looks like they, they really need to get into damage control mode. They need to figure out what's going on. They need to figure out what's up with that rotation. They need to ask themselves, why are they six games out of first place in the division that they should own? Um, I don't have answers for them. I haven't watched enough Boston baseball. You know, I have the, I have the same problem out here on the West Coast. Um, the only where, thing going for them right now is the fact that the division isn't a runaway. And Tampa right. can't be caught if they begin to slide. You know, right. that's what helps them is that everybody is bunched together. You're looking at a four and a half difference between one and two, and then a game and a half difference between two and five. Right. Right. So, I mean, I guess that's looking up. If Boston can figure it out and put it together, put some wins oh. together. Oh, they're but, looking up. They're looking six games up at the race. <laughs> but they need to – they need to put a run together and going four and six for their last 10 is not, not the way to do it. And they're losing to teams like the Baltimore Orioles who are teams that they shouldn't lose to, you know, teams that, that they should be able to pencil a W into that in uh, pencil, a mark into that W column. Uh, and they just can't. Right. So the moving American on League. to the central. Yeah, go. You're good. Um, this is a horrible division. <laughs> this is a terrible division. Um, you've got the Minnesota Twins on top of the American League Central by half a game at seven and four. They played three fewer games than everybody else in the in the division. Um, they've won one fewer game than two teams in the division, but they've managed to lose two fewer games than those two teams as well. Cleveland sitting at eight and six, the Detroit Tigers sitting at eight and six, the Chicago White Sox at four and nine, and the Kansas City Royals rounding out the bottom of that division at four and ten. I don't in know. In reality, this is this is right where we had it. We didn't have Detroit actually being above five hundred. Um, no, really, at any point. But aside from the the half game difference in the Indians and the Twins, which yeah, I think, granted especially with the Clevenger injury, which we didn't forecast for, obviously. I think this is about as chalk as we expected it to be. Right. We expected this to be a bad division, but I think we expected Cleveland to walk away with it a little bit. Hey, if, if there's at least some competition, that could make it worth watching. I mean, it, you know, I'm not saying it's going to be great baseball, but if you're trading body blows with two teams that aren't that great, at least it makes it entertaining to watch and enjoy. And and to be fair, the Twins just got to lose two games to to lose to to drop that slot, and it's entirely possible, it's entirely plausible that they are going to lose, drop a couple to Detroit. Detroit's been playing decent baseball, um, and and the Twins are in first place because they haven't been playing baseball at all. Right, and and Ron Gardenhire is a guy who all the success that we have come to that we saw with Minnesota in the early 2000s was under Ron Garden Hire's tenure. So uh, Detroit managed to pull in a, a veteran skipper, old school, long time veteran skipper to grab a rebuilding franchise. And if they manage to at least have, you know, if they can have an above 500 year, that's great. It's, it's, it should be met with the same muted expectations as what Minnesota should have been met with. when Paul Mahler won manager of the year. And it wasn't, and that backfired on them. But if Gardy begins to put together something consistent here, all of a sudden, the tone can begin to change a little bit in the American League Central. 
just hit West Coast, your neck of the woods. There's a team that's 13 and four sitting on top of the American League West, and that is not the Houston Astros. The Seattle Mariners sit with the best record in Major League Baseball at 13 and four, seven and three in their last 10 that they have lost two in a row. Keeping in mind that they lose three, that's a, that's a losing streak. And uh, yeah. I might say that when Chris Davis was batting, but hey, he he got a hit yesterday, three hits yesterday. If he gets a hit today, that's two in a row. If he gets a hit on Monday, that's a hitting streak. Uh, well, well, just had to felt like saying that, but again, best run differential there plus 36. There is some power here that wasn't expected, and I mean, right now, this team is not playing to their expectations, they're not playing to what probably was uh, kind of the rebuilding idea for what they were going to do. But hey, you know, I mean, it, if it continues good, I'm, I'm not sure how much they were hoping to have a really good draft pick out of the uh you know, out of this uh, out of this draft coming up. So we'll see how much Jerry DePoto and whatnot kind of keep going with the team as they sit. But the Astros at 10 and 5, the Oakland A's at 10 and 8, the Angels at 8 and 7, and the Rangers at the tail end at 6 and 7. We are on the cusp of the Rangers getting a getting a win against Oakland of having every team in the AL West at 500 or better. Not at all what you and I expected, and, and I do think that the Rangers will begin to kind of tail off a, a little bit. But the Angels, there is still talk about Otani wanting to try and pick up a bat and start swinging next month. The A's are, I mean, hey, they're five and five in their last ten, uh, but they've won four straight, which is impressive. The big thing for me right now is Houston. They, they're eight and two. They've won eight straight, and all of a sudden are are, are really chomping at the heels of the Mariners, and I think this is where we're going to begin to see things turn around as Jose Altuve became the first player in the majors this year to homer in five straight games last night. Well, it's good to see it's good to see them turn this thing around because it, it really looked bad for them for a while. Um, going into this eight-game winning streak, I was worried. I was worried about what was going on in Houston. They were two and five. They looked for all intents and purposes like a team that had just kind of lost its oomph. And I'm glad that they're not that team. They're not the team that it felt like they might have become. Um, and an eight-game winning streak is, well, it's nothing to shake a stick at. It's It's currently – the longest streak in Major League Baseball. And as they approach that that ninth game, who they'll have to play, which they'll have to play against Seattle, but they beat Seattle twice now. Um, it'll be interesting to see if, if the Mariners look at this as, as a direct attack on, on their position at the top there. And that'd be a big sweep. That'd be a big early season sweep for the Astros – uh, it really kind of get them get their footing back comfortably in the AL West. So, uh, you know, is is it a is a season changing series? Of course not. But I do believe, and I, I can see you nodding your head over there. I think we both think that this is one of those one of those fork in the road moments that you know you got a fork in the road, you got to take it. And this is a chance for them to go ahead and come in here and and maybe establish a little something to uh, to get themselves back on to. Uh, you know, on top in the in the American League West. Yeah, I think so, and I think that this is an opportunity for for Houston to really make a statement, and that's what Houston needs to do. Houston needs to come out and they need to make a statement right. against the Mariners. They need to make a statement to the A's, um, who are three and a half games behind them uh, by virtue of having played more games and, and having those those three extra losses. Right, the the, um, the, the Japan series. The Japan series, right? So this is this is a a big sort of day. Today is a big day for for Seattle and Houston because if Seattle can stop the slide, if they can beat the Astros today, prevent themselves from being swept, they lose the series, but they they also make a statement, right? You know that that uh, they're not just gonna they're not on a they're not on a fluke run, and they're not gonna let the team that should be the best. Just sweep them. Sure. 
Let's so let's, over. Let's, we'll start in the NL West. Let's go ahead and since we're already on the West Coast, the blue and white on top in the NL West at 11 and 5. Oh, I, I meant the blue and white Padres, not, not the blue and white Dodgers. The Padres sit on top of the National League West at 11 and 5, 8 and 2 in their last 10 winners of four straight. Uh, winners are four straight with a run differential of plus one. But hey, all you need to, all you need is one. You can win 11 one run games. It don't matter. It don't matter. That one run is and all. How, how many one run games did we see? Did we see teams like the the Red Sox and the Yankees win last year that were important in keeping them in the places where they need to be? And how many run run game one Mets. run games? Right? Did we see the Mets lose? That. Uh, that would have put them in a position to probably win that division. Absolutely. Had, had they given Jacob DeGrom any, any run support. Yeah. The, the, the Dodgers sit second there in Milwaukee. They've lost six straight. They are at an even 508 and eight at the moment. But again, looking at Milwaukee and, and another possible sweep there, your giant somehow sitting at seven and nine facing the bottom of the barrel Rockies the Diamondbacks six and nine, then the middle and the Rockies at three and twelve. They have lost eight straight, uh, a minus thirty six run differential, the worst in Major League Baseball, as you mentioned earlier. And um, so, as I said, you know, I, I don't foresee the Rockies winning the NL West. There's no, re- I mean, I never would have said that when we when we did um, our divisional. Mm. Place. I never would have mm. said that at all. And and. and, and- and, and and I never would have said that that San Diego might end up in third. Well, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on now. Yeah. If I go back to that conversation, I believe you yelled at me. So, uh, you know, I, I. To be fair, and I'm not gonna sit here and and make make light of my pick, but I don't think either of us projected the Rockies at a three and twelve team. I mean, this is no. This I don't. Neither of that. us projected the Rockies. Neither of us projected the Rockies at the bottom of this division. No, I, 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 I thought we were looking at the Rockies probably finishing second, um, and, and at least pushing the Dodgers. I did not. I, I really uh, am floored on this. So, well, prior to going into these last two, these last two uh, series that they played against San Diego and now against San Francisco, um, I. Didn't, I still saw the Colorado Rockies as a, as a number two team, but they've lost eight straight. Yeah. I mean, that I'm sorry. <laughs> That's unsustainable. You know, the Dodgers have lost six in a row. Unsustainable. They had a hot start, so, you know, but, but there are some big question marks. And that Both really – this really has been – and I don't understand why, but this really has been a division of constant ebb and flow. There is very, and I get that that's baseball in general, but there has been very little continuity in this in this division, other than the Dodgers winning the division, which should have happened the last three years handily and almost didn't last year. But I mean, how many times did we talk about really early on last year of of first and third, first and fourth? Just I mean, it was bouncing every week. Now I think we had probably right. three or four straight weeks of shows. Or the division leader was different every single time. Well, and to be fair, this division has been like this since 2009. Yeah. Right? 2009, the Giants are uh, third place team. 2010, they win the World Series. Right. 2011, 2011, they can't even make the wild card. And that's where you're at. Is they're a wild card team two out of the three championships they win. Right, 2012, they go to the playoffs, but they go as a wild card team. The Dodgers win that division. The Dodgers win that division. The Dodgers win that division. It's just, you know, it's – or, you know, when the Rockies win the division. There's no continuity in the West Coast. And I'm not really sure what it is about the West Coast. But to be fair, the American League West is kind of the same way. Yeah, you know, we we bounce around for who's going to be in control of this American League West. Houston's been in control for the last couple of years, but prior to that, it was Texas, and then it was Houston, and it was Oakland. The, the, the Angels were in there in the mix for a long time, but yeah, there was no really real continuity. Late two thousands, early teens, it was the Rangers division, and we thought there was going to be a lot more 
longevity there, then it kind of just fell off. Of course, Josh Hamilton leaves and, um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, without hearing from him, I hope he's doing you know, okay with all of his personal demons that he, he fought during his career. If you go to the Central, the Milwaukee Brewers sit on top. Now, that was my pick uh, for uh, – I believe that was my pick for the uh, – to win the NL Central. Uh, the St. Louis Cardinals at 8-6 and six in second place. The Pittsburgh Pirates 7-6. and six. The Reds at 5-8. and eight, And the Cubs at 5-9. and nine. Uh, The Cubs just – obviously, a rough game last, uh, last night or yesterday afternoon – Schwarber called out on the check swing by Gabe Morales, ejected. Even Chicago announcers say it looked like Schwarber uh, swang. He's Schwarber swang. Like Schwarber swung the bat through it. So, hey, you try saying it and tell me you're not going to go ahead. I feel like I'm I'm in Wayne's world. Swing. Uh, but right now, Chicago, a, a team that uh, you you might hear from again here in just a little bit. In the East, the Mets on top, nine and five, right behind them. The Phillies at a half game back at eight and five, and the Braves eight and six. The Nationals seven and six, and the Marlins well back at four and eleven. Man, right now we got four teams in the NL East, a game and a half out of first place. Um, I, I'm 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 a little bit happy with that right now. Best differential, the Nationals have a plus twelve. I'm not saying that that they're going to win the division. But I'm feeling a little bit better about picking them now than I did at the beginning of the year. So that's at least a weight off my shoulders since the Rocky side. Right. And and this NL East division, we're talking about another division where four of the five teams are above five hundred. And the differential between first and fourth is only a game and a half. So this is a competitive division. Um it's kind of fun to watch these teams play each other because uh, with the exception of the Miami Marlins, um, all of these teams are, are playing for, for domination. I mean, they're, they're all playing for the lead right now. And, you know, there's not a lot of divisions in baseball right now where we can say that uh, where a game or two is the difference. Um, although the Miami Marlins did beat the Philadelphia Phillies yesterday. Yeah. Oops. So, <laughs> So let's go ahead and and look at our top five, bottom three, and see where we differ. Um, I, I don't. I think we might be maybe a little more more alike than than we think. Uh, I'll go ahead and lead off. I got. I, I have a hard time not putting the Seattle Mariners at number one, only because we didn't expect this of them. So I have the Mariners at one. I had the Padres at two. The Tampa Bay Rays at three. The Brewers at four, and the Astros at five okay um we're almost packed so i have the mariners at one the padres at two um and i really (laughs) you're gonna get mad when i read my notes here um for my notes next to the San Diego Padres, it says, this is really just to piss Graham off. I made a prediction he didn't like, and now that team is third best in baseball. <laughs> Four-game win streak. <laughs> you know, Four-game you know, win streak. That's why no one likes you, right? Yeah. Four-game <laughs> win streak, eight and, two, eight and two in their last ten, hashtag Tatis Jr. <laughs> Those are my notes. <laughs> um, I got Tampa Bay Rays at three. I got the Houston Astros at four and the Milwaukee Brewers at five. And I swapped the Brewers and the Astros because the Astros are on that eight no, straight streak win streak. I, 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 I can see that one. I just, for me, Milwaukee's been consistent. So even though the Astros are streaking, I like the fact that Milwaukee has been up there and stayed up there and Houston's having to fight their way to get back into a contention spot. So that's, I, that was the big one for me. Bottom three, just because of the expectation I have the Cubs in my bottom three. Um, one of the worst teams. I do too. All out of sorts. I'm really disappointed. I'm really concerned. The Miami Marlins, because of the Marlins, and, and they're not going to have, I don't think, the same kind of production last year. Last year was not good and still seemed better than it should have been. And I don't think there's any way we don't both have as the worst team right now or on our bottom three, the Colorado Rockies. So, yeah, I have uh, worst team, Rockies next to the Marlins, and then, again, the Chicago Cubs. So I think we're pat there. Okay. Um, I, I know you said the Dodgers, Marlins, and, 
if the Dodgers no, I, further down, I'm I'm right. apt to put them in there. But right now at eight and eight, if they it can was, get it right and they're still able to kind of make a, a push back against the, the Padres, we can come into next week's show and see the Dodgers on top of the division. Hard to put them in the right, bottom and when I, until eight and eight. When I when I made that when I made that comment earlier when I said that I think the Dodgers are out of my top five, I meant just out of my top five, not into my bottom three. Okay. Um I mean, there's 30 teams and we're only picking eight. So out of my top five still put them in, in contention, but, you know, not into my bottom three yet. So, you know, at least Boston's not there. Um, and, and I think the interesting thing right now is because of the jumbled up way that a lot of these divisions look, it's going to make our bottom three kind of funky. Um, yeah. I don't think it's going to make our top five very weird because, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to be basing this off more – of you know really who's who is where long term I, I know i know we're looking top five bottom three kind of uh, uh, of of the week but you know this you know you this know what's really going to look wonky if, if things if right if things our keep looking rankings, the way they look yeah. our power ranking rankings are really, really going to start to look funky and um i think it'll be interesting sort of to see what we come up with for this first 30 team power ranking um, I anticipate that conversation taking a while. Yeah. Um, I, anticipate uh, that I, I think we, we might be having a lot of compromise. So. Yeah, this might be a lot of compromise, trying to find the right spot for, for each, each ball club. Right. Especially, what do you do? I mean, you, do you power rank the Cincinnati Reds ahead of the Chicago Cubs? No. But are the Cincinnati Reds ahead of the Chicago Cubs? Yeah. And that's hard. That makes it tough. You know, because now we're, now we're projecting out to the end of the year. It, it does. And, and I don't think that we're too far away from the Reds being actually better right now. Um, I mean, I don't care how good they are. You know, the Cubs are looking to a point like the Tigers did back in 13 and 14 after they made the World Series against the aforementioned Giants. Everything fell apart. and They started moving guys off like Scherzer. Uh, you know, you know, you, Victor Martinez retired finally. You had Cabrera, you had Prince Fielder. All of a sudden, it'll be going to be huge. Wasn't there? It'll be really interesting to see if any of those big names in their rotation are up for grabs uh, anytime soon. Because if they are, they could they could do a lot yeah. with what they could get back for some Absolutely. of those names. For sure, I agree. So there you have it, guys. Top five, bottom three. We both have the Cubs, the Marlins, and the Rockies. We both have the Mariners, the Padres, the Rays, the Brewers, and the Astros. With us just flipping Milwaukee and Houston between four and five, uh, each with, I think, a, a pretty logical feel behind it. So if you agree, let us know. At OO Left Field on Twitter, out of left field with Chris and Graham on Facebook. And be sure to go by thegruelingtruth.com and sign up at mybookie.ag. Thanks for hanging out with us, guys. Always great to be with you. Look forward to seeing you back here next week on the show. For Chris, I'm Graham. Everybody here at gluingcruth.com. Have a great week. See you next time on Out of Left Field.